All right, the second video should be a little quicker. Um, we're going to be just going through some examples. So let's take a look at our first one. Estimate the volume of a solid that lies below the surface Z equals XY and above the rectangle um, R, which is defined as X, every XY point where X is, lies between 0 and 6 inclusive and Y lies between 0 and 4 inclusive. Use a Riemann sum with M equals 3, N equals 2, and take the sample point to be the upper right corner of each square. So this is what a part where I was telling you um, this is going to be very much like our right hand, our left hand, our midpoint, um, stuff like that. Of course, now down here in Part B, it says use the midpoint to estimate the volume of the solid in Part A. So we're going to do it twice, but we're going to um, basically start off by doing some kind of a really bad sketch, because Lord only knows what exactly this surface. Whoops, don't want to do that. What the heck happened there? Um, don't even know exactly what this surface looks like. But again, what you've got is you've got some kind of a region, you know, up here, just kind of up here in space somewhere, whatever this XY looks like. And the general concept is that we have to go 6 in the X direction because it says X goes from 0 to 6. So, you know, 6 is probably out here. Um, 4 maybe in the Y direction is right about there. So this is the rectangular region that this thing is on top of. That's really bad. Let's try that again. Okay, Not great, but you get the idea. So here is our rectangular region. This is R. <coughs> So whatever this thing projects up to this surface um, on over top of this region, it's that portion of it that we're going to take the volume and estimate the volume by using this rectangular Riemann sum. So in this case, it says, let um, use a Riemann sum with m equals 3, n equals 2. The m part is associated with our x, and the n part is associated with our y. I don't know why specifically that is, other than I can tell you that it's pretty typical it, um, that it goes in alphabetical order. M is going to go with X, N is going to go with Y. So what I like to do is I like to basically take this rectangular region, and I like to sketch it two-dimensionally down here. So that's what I'm going to do. So we're going to take and we're going to sketch R to be the rectangular region. Looks like it starts at the origin here, goes out six units in the x direction, and four units in the y direction. So basically, that's two, let's see, it'd be two, four, six, this is zero. <coughs> so basically, this is going to be our, our, um, our region right here. <coughs> Excuse me. What it says is, um, let M, which is our X, be 3. So in other words, I want to cut this into three equal partitions, which I've kind of already done. So here's one, two, one, two, three partitions. Then I'm going to take N, which is our Y, and I'm going to cut it into two equal partitions, which is basically cutting it in half. One, two, here. So what I've really done is I've created six different places on this on this um, space right here would be like one two and then cut that in half I'm going to end up with six rectangular prisms to approximate this um, this volume of the, under the of the surface above the XY plane and typically the way you're going to know that you're going to take your two partitions and multiply them together and you know you should have six regions three times two is six so what I've got is that this is and it doesn't really matter what order you do this in I just called that one R1, R2, R3, R4. There is no particular rhyme or reason for these particular numbers. I'm just labeling them so we know what we're looking at. All right, so pretty simple. Volume of a rectangular prism, length times width times height. What I should be able to see here is Every single one of these things right here is going to have exactly the same length and exactly the same width. This is a 2, this is 2, 
this is two across, this is two up, this is two across, this is two up. So all of my length times my width here are going to be four. They're all two by two. So really it's just this height which is based upon the information given here. And the first one they told us they wanted to use the upper right corner of each square. So again, the idea was in um, ABBC, what we would take is we would take the right-hand endpoint or the left-hand endpoint of something, uh, the rectangles under the curve. Well, now we're going to take a specific part of each one of these rectangles. So the first one is wanting us to do is take the upper right-hand corner of each square. Well, I have six squares. Of this square, the upper right-hand corner is right here. Of this square, the upper right corner is here. Of this square, the upper right hand corner is here. Of R4, it's here. R5, it's here. R6, it's here. And what this means is that as we extend these things up, so as you were to take these pieces right here, if this was the first rectangular region, the upper right hand corner would be here. As I extend this rectangular prism up, this piece right here is the part that's going to hit the surface right there. That's going to become our f of xy. That's the height of this rectangular prism. And we're going to do the upper right-hand corner for each one of these things. Well, to figure it out, it's pretty simple. I'm going to take whatever point this is. This is the point 2, comma 2. And my um, surface is defined as z equals xy. So I'm going to plug in 2 and 2 for x and y to find my z value. So if z is xy, then if I use the point 2, 2, the z value is going to be 4. So let's actually, let's say that in a slightly different way. For R1, <coughs> excuse me, it's xy, which is 4, times the length times the width, which was 4, because that's the area of the base. So what I'm going to get is R1 equals 16. For R2, let's see, the point here is the point 4, 2, right there, 4, 2. So if I plug that into xy, 4 times 2 is 8, times my height, I'm sorry, times my length times my width, which is already given as 4, because it's 4 for every single one of these, so that's going to be 32. And we're going to do that for all six of these things, all the way down to R6. Well, we can make this a little bit easier because of the fact that we know the length times the width is always 4. And then really what I just need to do is find the xy value of each one of these things and multiply them together. I need to find the z value here, 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 and add them all up. And that's only because we know that these partitions are all going to have exactly the same area of the base here, which is 4. So that's going to be, let's see, we said already said that one was 4. This one we said was 8. Okay, if I take this one right here, it's 6 and 2, so 6 times 2 is 12. Let's move up to R4. R4, the point is 2, 4, so 2 times 4 is 8. Uh, R5, it's 4 times 4, which is 16. And then R6, it's 6 times 4, which is 24. And then I'll add all these things up and multiply it by 4. So all of this added up, I believe it was 72, so we get 4 times 72. You can double check that just to be sure. Uh, 4 times 72, 2 times 72 is 144, so 288. So what I end up with is an approximated volume of 288 cubic units. And then the, the same idea, because we want to do part B now, the same idea holds for part B. But now instead of using the upper right hand endpoints, I'm going to use the midpoints of each one of these squares. So for part B, I now want to use this point, this point, because this is the midpoint of each one of these squares. It's got to be the middle coming in the X and Y directions. So using the midpoints, 
the base is the the base of this thing is still going to be four every single time, right? The base is two. The I'm sorry, the length is two. The width is two. So the base of every one of these rectangles is still four. That hasn't changed. It's really just the x y value or the height, the z value of this surface that's going to change. And now we're just looking at the middle of each one of these rectangles to to give us that height. Well, the middle of this one is one. The middle in this direction is one. So this is a one by one right here. So that's going to be 1 times 1, which is 1. The middle of this piece is, let's see, it's 3 by 1. So it's going to be um, 3. And then the middle of this one is 5 times 1. So that's going to be 5. And then moving up to R4, it's 1 by 3. So that's 3. Our 5 here is going to be 3 by 3, which is 9. And then our 6 here, the last one is 5 by 3, which is 15. And let's see, adding all this up, 15, 24, 8, 9, uh, 36, uh, you know, yeah, 36. So that'll be 4 times 36. Uh, 36 double to 72, doubling that's 144. So we get 144 cubic units. And you can obviously tell by looking at the two of these, if I use the upper right-hand corners, I get 288 cubic units. If I use the middle of these things, I get 144 cubic units. And like I said, we don't exactly know what the surface looks like. So we really don't know in this case which one of these things is a better approximation. But there's a pretty vast difference between the two. And that's because of the fact that we're really only using six rectangles to approximate this thing. So these approximations are probably not very close. But you never know, because again, at this point, we don't have our method to, to do the exact value. All right, example two. Use a Riemann sum with m equals n equals 2 to estimate the value of the double integral over r of sine of x plus y dA, where r goes from 0 to pi and 0 to pi. So it doesn't make any difference. It's the same um, distance in each direction. Take the sample points to be lower left corners. And then we also want to do one using the midpoints for this one as well. So again, let's sketch our domain. I find that to be a, a good way to start. So according to this, it's going to be a 2 by 2 in each x and y direction. Again, usually that's x, that's y. Uh, in this case, because the region here is 0 to pi, 0 to pi, it doesn't make any difference. So our region R is going to go 0 to pi, 0 to pi. So here is my rectangular region. All right, so let's see, m and n are 2, so we're going to separate this rectangular region into a 2 by 2 section. So that means this would be pi halves. And this would also be pi halves. OK, so according to this, we want to do the lower left-hand corner. So let's go red on this one. So the lower left-hand corner, which would be of this, re of this box is here, of this box is here, of this box is here, and of this box it's here. So we need these four points as our um, as our values that we're going to have to plug in. The function itself is sine of x plus y. That's going to be our z value, basically. So let's see. Each one of these boxes is identical in um, length and width. So it's pi halves by pi halves. So really, our length times width is going to be pi squared over 4. <coughs> and then the volume that we're going to get the approximation using the lower left hand corner, if I plug in 0, 0 into here, I get sine of 0, which is 0. So 0 times pi squared over 4 is 0. And of course, we would do that for all of them. So my volume is going to be pi squared over 4. 0 was the first one. We're going to figure out this one right here, which is um, 
pi halves for x, 0 for y. So that's really going to be the sine of pi halves, which is 1. This one is pi halves and pi halves. So this is going to be sine of pi, which is 0. And then this one is 0 pi halves, which is also 1. So it looks like I'm going to get 2 from inside of here. 2 times pi squared over 4 is going to give us pi squared over 2 cubic units. That's if we use the lower left-hand corner. Now it also wants us to do this using the midpoints. So that's going to come from here, 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 and here. Of course, in between here is going to be pi fours, 3 pi fours, and so on. So we'll have to keep all that straight. So if we do the midpoint, the volume, the, the area of the base hasn't changed. So we know the volume is going to be pi squared over 4 times all of these things plugged into sine of x plus y. So this is pi fourths, this is pi fourths. Adding those together, we get pi halves. So sine of pi halves is 1. Over here, this is 3 pi fourths, pi fourths. So that's going to be pi. Sine of pi is 0. Uh, going up to this box right here, this is pi force. This is 3 pi force. So again, pi force and 3 pi force is pi. Sine of pi is 0. And then the last box up here, this is 3 pi force. This is 3 pi force. That's going to be 6 pi force, which is 3 pi halves. Sine of 3 pi halves is negative 1. So I get 1 plus negative 1 is 0. That's interesting. Volume is zero. Well, you can't really have zero volume, but if you remember back to calculus ABBC, when we took the areas um, of a curve and the curve did something like this, the area up here we considered positive area, the area down here we considered negative area, and if this area happened to be exactly the same as this area right here, it would cancel out and basically become zero. Same exact idea, this just means that there is an equal amount of volume above and below the xy plane. That's all that that means. And if you were to get negative area, or excuse me, negative volume out of this, it just means that you would have more volume below this thing's surface. That's all, before the, below the xy plane. All right, number three. Uh, where am I? Here we go. Number three. So a table of values is given for the function f of x, y. So we're not actually given the function. We're just given a bunch of values here. The table defined from 1 to 3 and 0 to 4. Estimate the double integral using the midpoint rule with m and n both equaling 2. So again, we're going to cut this thing into um, two equal partitions. So it looks to me like x goes from 1 to 3, and y goes from 0 to 4. So if we sketch our, um, our two-dimensional domain, our r region, so x went from 1 to 3. Here's 1. Here's 3. And y went from 0 to 4. So... Uh, maybe right about there, 0 to 4. So it looks like our R region looks something like that. And it said that M and N were both 2, I believe. Yes. So we'll cut that in half. We'll cut that in half, which makes that pretty simple there. So, and it wants us to use midpoints. So if I use the midpoint... I am looking at that point, that point, 
that point and that point. So it looks like along the x I'm looking at 1.5 and 1. So 1.5, y is 1. I'm looking at that. That right there is going to represent the height. Uh, second box over, that's 2.5 and 1. So 2.5 right here and 1 for y. That one. And then for this box up here, 1.5 and 3. 1.5 for x, 3 for y. And then this one is 2.5 and 3. Right there. And that really should make sense, because really what we could have done is we could have just broken this thing into um, equal partitions as well if we wanted to um, basically from... No, that's not right. What am I doing? <coughs> Excuse me. You'd actually have to split it right down here. I don't really want to draw that in there, but um, ultimately what you're looking at is your rectangles would be from here to here, and then from here to there, and then from here to here, and then from here to there. So the midpoints would be um, the values in between. So really quickly, the volume here, it looks like each one of these things is going to have um, one for the length, two for the height, so the volume is going to be two times the sum of all these things right here, one plus five minus eight minus one, one minus one is zero, five minus eight is negative three, so we're going to get negative six units cubed. So this thing would have an approximated volume of negative six cubic units. All right, we can do the same general idea using a contour map. Contour map is going to be a little different because it's going to be a little more of an approximation, but it's the same general idea. So we'll use the midpoint with m and n equaling 2. Good thing is they've already kind of broken this up for us. Estimate the value of the double integral. So if we go with uh, green here, so it looks like if m and n both equal 2, that each one of these things is going to be split like this. Which means that my midpoint is going to be here. Midpoint of this one is going to be here. Midpoint of this one is going to be here. And the midpoint of this one is going to be here. The hard part is going to be approximating using these contours the actual value. And it's it's going to vary for everybody. The one thing we do know is that each one of these rectangles has a base of 2 by 2. So I do know that my volume will have a base area of 4 times all of my approximated heights using the midpoints. So if I start here, so this one is in between the two contours of 20 and 30. It Definitely looks like um, this is much closer to 30. So I'm going to say this is maybe 27, 28, using a good approximation. It's, like I said, it could vary. Plus, going to this one, this one looks almost in between the 10 and the 20, maybe just a hair closer to the 10. So maybe 14. I don't know. It's close. This one right here, let's see, this one looks like this is 0, this is 10, this is 0. So in between the 0 and the 10 here, looks like it could be, I don't know, it's just a slight bit closer to the 0 than it is to the 10. So I might call it 4, you might have said 5, it really just depends. And then the last one here, this is definitely in between the 10 and the 20, definitely closer to the 20. So I'm going to go with, I don't know, 16. 17, I don't, again, it's just an approximation. It should be close. So the volume that we get using the midpoints here is 4 times, what's that going to be, uh, 16 and 4 is 20, um, 47, 61, does that look right? Yeah, 61. So it looks like I'm going to get an approximate of 244 cubic units. 
Now, of course, we don't know exactly know what this contour map is representing, so because of that, I'm just going to kind of make something up. Because what we're going to try and do now is we're going to try and estimate the average value of f. So to do that, and I apologize because the video is running a little bit longer than I wanted it to, but um, to do that, let's go back to the idea of average value when we were in two dimensions. Whoops. In two dimensions, the idea was if I had some kind of a curve like this, and I took all the areas of the rectangles here and added them up, the idea was that someplace along this curve there is an average height of this thing, maybe it's right here, who knows, where if I took the rectangle that was created, the area of this rectangle would be exactly the same as the area under the curve from the left end point to the, to the right end point. Basically, the idea is saying that this is the average height of all of the approximating rectangles, this one right here. And it could happen more than once. It probably happens here, too. Um, but this rectangle right here, the rectangle that's created, would actually give you the average height of all of the rectangles. And the general idea is this. How do you find the average of something? Well, you add them up and then divide by how many there are. The average value of a function was taking the integral, adding up all of your rectangles, and then dividing by how many rectangles there were. Well, you're going from A to B, so the number of rectangles is B minus A. So instead of writing it over B minus A, we typically wrote it like that. That was your average value function. No difference here. Same, same general idea. I'm going to take the average of all of the heights of my, in this case, approximating rectangular prisms, and I'm going to divide it by how many rectangular prisms or the total area of this thing that I could have. So one way to think of it is, especially since we're now into, um, you know, winter time, is that maybe these contours represent the amount of snowfall, because as we all know, snow doesn't stay in one exact area. It drifts. So over here, you might not have any, but over here, because of, you know, the winds and stuff, it's pushed up, and you got 30 inches over here, but down in this area, you only have zero. Over here, you've got 10 inches and so on. If you could take all of that snow and you could level it out, like push all of the snow that you would have everything in here, take all of the snow and level it out so that it's nothing more than one flat surface throughout the whole thing. I actually want to get rid of that, but that's the idea. Then how much would be that average? What would be the average amount of height of snow? So to find the average value, I'm going to take all of the stuff that we just added up using the midpoints, and I'm going to divide it by the total area of this base. Well, the total area of the base here is a 4 by 4 section, which is 16. This is part B. 16. And then whatever 244 divided by 16, 15 point something, is going to be um, the area. 15.25. There we go. So the average is going to be the double integral over r of f of x, y dA divided by the area of your base, area of R. And that'll give you the average height of all of the rectangular prisms that you would create up here. So there you go. All right, I believe we have one more to go. All right, let's evaluate the double integral uh, by first identifying it as a volume of a solid. So this actually says evaluate the double integral. We are no longer estimating. This is actually wants us to evaluate it. However, we're not going to do it, like I said in this video, by integrating. We're actually going to do this by finding the area of the volume of the solid. So it would really help us to know what this thing, this z value, looks like, what this is. Well, the first thing I notice is that if z equals 4 minus 2y, first of all, all these variables here are um, uh, raised to the power 1, so it's going to be some kind of a plane, and there's no x whatsoever, so x is really anything. x can, x can vary. x will not um, make any difference here. 
So if I want to figure out what this thing looks like, let's get to some values here. So if z um, is not, not equals, if z evaluated at 0, 0, the only thing I can plug in is y, so we get out 4. If we evaluate z at 1, 0, so again, x makes no difference, we still get out 4, and that's the way it should be. And why did I pick these in particular values? Because they're the endpoints. Um, so I'm going to want to figure out what z at 0, 1 is. And if I plug 1 in here, I'm going to get that z would be um, 2. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. 4 minus 2 is 2. Yep. Oop, come on. There we go. And if we do z at 1, 1, which is the last endpoint, we would also get and again, really, that should make sense. So let's take a look at this. So z at 0, 0 is 4 up here. We'll call that 4. z at 1, 0, so come out here, 1 unit, nothing in the y direction. The height should also be 4. Remember to try and stay parallel. So it should look something like that along the top. Makes sense. Z at 0, 1, which is out here. The height is 2, so we'll come up here to 2. Oops, come on, take a straighter line. Eh, not good. Wow, oh, that's just not good. Maybe I'll go this direction. Yeah, a little better. Um, and then z at 1, 1, which is 1, 1. So we're going to go here and then up to units. So right about here. And connect those pieces. So there's the plane right there between um, 0, 1 and 0, 1 over top of our rectangular region which again looks something like this. That would connect there, that would connect there, that would connect there, and then of course that one connects down there. So here is our here's our region. And really it just looks like some kind of a geometric three-dimensional prism. Um, and as a matter of fact, this one actually looks like as a trapezoidal prism of some kind because it looks like the sides of these things all make trapezoids. If I kind of look at the side here, that's really not good because it's not straight, but there you go. The sides of this thing is a trapezoid, and if I take and slice this thing perpendicular um, to the x-axis, every slice all the way from here, I am really not drawing straight today. There we go. From here over to here, every single one of these is a trapezoid, where this is a base, this is a base, this is the height. Remember that the bases of a trapezoid are the parallel parts. The height is perpendicular to the, um, to the parallel sides, and then this is the diagonal piece right here. So really, what I am trying to find is I am trying to find the volume of a prism. In this case, it is trapezoidal. So if I can find the volume of one slice of this thing right here and then add up all the slices, then I can go ahead and find the, uh, the volume of this thing of this double integral. So I know that the volume of a uh, excuse me, the area of a trapezoid is one half the sum of the bases times the height. Well, it doesn't matter which, um, where I take the slice, the, the bases are always the same. This base one is always the same. The base one is the difference between here and here. It goes from the bottom up to here. We already know that height is four. So that's going to have one half base one, which is four. This one has a height of two. And then the height between here and here is goes from 0 out to 1, 
So that's 1. This is the area of one of the slices. So what is that? 6 divided by 2 is 3. Ah, where'd the pen go? There we go. But now I need to take the area of this trapezoid right here, and I need to add it infinitely in this direction. So really, I need to take this distance right here, which is um, goes from 0 out to 1 as well. and multiply that times the area of this trapezoid. So 3 times 1 is 3, whatever the units are cubed. And this is a representation of the double integral over r of 4 minus 2y dA. Now, granted that the only reason that we could actually do this is because this did have a nice geometric shape here that we could actually, into, um, not integrate, but that we could actually um, take the area of and then multiply that area times the length of the entire um, figure up here. That's the only reason we could do it this way. Next time we will start learning how to actually take um, and evaluate double integrals using actual integration. But there you have it. Sorry the videos ran a little longer than I was hoping, but... Um, that should be enough to get the lesson done. The, the, the problem should be pretty simple.